Welcome to the Human Design Collective Podcast, where we explore this system as a unique map of our potential, from the mundane to the mystical. This episode is the second part of our talk with Alakanan Diaz, where we go deeper into his experience with Ra Uruhu and the meaning of frequency in an individual and in relationship. We also discuss Alok's monthly class called The Program Is Not Your Life, which is his way of looking at global transit analysis month by month. It reveals the themes that affect us all, especially during the current COVID-19 crisis. Lastly, we look at the interface of science and truth, and how human design is a deeply logical system that can explain a life beyond reason. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't look much into the back, so it's nice to, it's nice to review those places also because uh, it depends who's asking. Yeah. How my breath waits for the memories to come that I share. It's very different. So I'm enjoying it. I'm curious about, especially because of what you had mentioned about relationships uh, in the beginning, I sense the way you talk about Ra, that obviously this was a very, very unique relationship. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (sighs) Fuck yes. (laughs) (laughs) What that experience with Ra and the uniqueness of that connection that you and the experience that you had with him over many years, what that showed you about relationship? Well, you know, I can give you a simple answer to this. I never spoke about Ra like he is my friend. He, I heard him say often, my friend Alok, when he was speaking to someone else, and, and you know, I would come up in his mind as an example for whatever. Um, but it was clear to me that, you know, it was, it was nice. I liked it that he called me his friend, but to me, he was, uh, he was so much more than a friend. The one thing I never allowed him to be, if I say it like this, it can sound like he wanted to be my guru, which I don't think he wanted to be anybody's guru. I mean, uh, he was just an ego manifester and I guess he was clear that, you know, most of the time, you know, if you want to communicate with him, you were on the listening end. Because he was the one who knew, you know, he was not interested in your story or your stuff or your this or your that. He was, you know, he had a job to do. He was the messenger. And the quicker you knew that, the easier things were going to go. Now, you understand, you know, I had had a guru, and I, but this guy was just a mortal human being, which, by the way, It was what I adored about him, how human he was. You know, maybe because I'm a first-line personality and he had all this first-line unconscious that I so, you know, I connected with him in this coffee. And I had already had this negative projection on him when I saw this, you know, the black bird projection. And the fifth, so that the fifth-line personality in him, not that I didn't like it. I mean, you know, I, I liked everything about him. But uh, I was aware of the seductive, in, you know, the seductive influence that that had on me. I mean, you know, he had the same power to seduce me psychologically than any seductive hot girl, you know, would have if she finds me and I'm not engaged with anyone, you know. It's just like, you know, the sacral smile. I mean, how could I ever resist that? But you know that you're under some kind of spell, so you, you know, being skeptical as I am, it was like, you know, I mean, let's make sure I keep the ground. But no, I never saw him as a friend. He was clearly the teacher, not just my teacher, because there was no other teacher, okay? I love man. You know, he lived what he said. I watched him, and I don't remember one time seeing him not be his design. See, actually, when I told you these times when, you know, these doubts that came and made this all, because with my design, triple split, this open G, with this, my kind of mind, I knew I can make up anything. It was like, how do I get out of this now, you know? I would look at him, I would look at his design, and I would just go like, 
she was so obviously that any time of the day, not just with me, with everybody, with his wife, with his children, there was no exceptions. There were no exceptions. You could not get this guy to bend. You could not, you know, you could not go against him and win. You could not. And he was not interested in running anybody over either. He was fucking cool. And he, you know, he really did not care if you believed or not. He was standing on his own. I could feel that in his in his voice, his eyes. His, you know, there was this guy. This was not a normal human being. And this was not someone on an altar. And then there was the man, you know, you, the poet in me. Hey, I love this man. You know, if I was gay, hey, mamma mia. Yeah. I, you know, could have, good be, I wasn't gay and he wasn't either. <laughs> but I remember sitting in his room and listening to him play like he's alone, like you would do when your lover is sitting there and you don't mind. Because, well, I guess that was part of our connection. It was a lot for silence too. And uh, the lyrics of his songs, the poetry in this, I saw the man and the mystic and, uh, and the guy who had spoken to a voice, you know? <laughs> See, I didn't give a damn about this voice. I cared about this man and this body graph of his. That was enough for me. Where the hell he got that from, I didn't care. I didn't care. For me, it was, is this body graph objective or is this made up? The perfection of it in the very first five-day training that I did. And today, after 27 years, taking this thing apart, what a piece of engineering. You cannot figure that out. <laughs> you, don't, you don't. You don't. Yeah. And not misplace one piece. You misplace one piece and the whole thing falls apart. So that's what just kept me in the play, you know. It was clear from the beginning. Don't believe me. Don't trust me. I love that. That's the one, three. I love that. And of course, I didn't believe him. I didn't, I didn't trust him. Or it's not that I didn't believe him. I didn't trust him. I trusted myself trusting the process. And when I didn't trust the process, well, it looked like I didn't trust him. You know, because I made questions that, you understand? I mean, I had my projections on him. Because that's what, we're human. That's what we are. We're projection machines. So, you know, like I had this incredibly poetic projections on him, I also had this diabolic projections, you know. Because I have my own demon and my own divinity to deal with. You know, I, I did not know about Godheads at the time. There were many, 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 many layers of the density of my psychic body that I had to pierce through until I could totally let go to be all that definition that you know is on my design and that openness at the core. I mean, openness, this blankness in the jitsen. It's like you're living, you know, having a direction that has a 360 degree scope. Figure out who you are in that scope mentally and you're lost, you know, <laughs> you're lost in an instant, you know. The first seven years were very, very intense because, you know, I was so excited about the knowledge and every time we would meet to do some, some training together in Spain, which we did in different places, we would spend anything between uh, eight to ten days together, you know, for two months. I could feel the, you know, the bzzz, the, the, um, it was intense to put all this through my system, you know, because, and, you know, it's repetition, but, but also made me just skilled in the language, and, uh, you know. And the process was slow, you know, the process of types and profiles and different kinds of authority, and then, you know, the, 
deeper elaboration on the psychology of the different kinds of definitions, single split, double split, triple split, you know, all of those things, profiles, incarnation crosses. I was 12 years into this foundation, you know, when he started the infrastructure. Wow. It was like going back to zero for me. So, you know, like suddenly he put the carpet again under my feet. You know, you know, it was like, oh, now I know the body graph. I know the mandala. I know how, whoosh, you know, again, and the deeper veils of illusion, you know, the seeing and the thinking, you know, when you're no longer distracted by whatever gates or centers you quote unquote don't have which is how people speak about their openness, you know, something they don't have. Um, which of course, it's not true. It's not true. I mean, to say that you, you don't have a, a, a G-center, it's like saying you don't have a liver, you know. <laughs> so, so that was an amazing process. And, um, and that led to, you know, he stopped, he toured less and less because he used to get tired, especially after when he, he toured the United States, he used to come back very tired because they were very long tours and he didn't enjoy America very much at the time. So he concentrated the work more and more on the international events in Ibiza and people coming to Ibiza. And that lasted for... Well, we did the first one in 1996, and it lasted basically, you know, in 2011, he was going to do the 25th anniversary when he passed. Mm -hmm. So for 17 years, you know, we collaborated uh, deeply on you know, the radio and the early newsletters every step of the way. We only lost, um, interrupted the flow of communication. I mean... I'm saying zero, not an email, not an email for three years. When he suddenly disappeared from uh, Ibiza and popped up in America, he did not say any a word to anyone. He did, he just went. Supposedly I was a friend, you know, it was like the informing thing was like, what? I was translating the newsletters, but um, there was no person, uh, you know, I, I, I felt hurt. I felt a bit, you know, I, but it was clear. It was something that, you know, had already come up a few times that, you know, I, I, I built expectations and he was Mr. Cool. And the year 2000, he comes back <clears throat> and he calls us all together. And we were going to do the first living your design teacher training. It was called the basic course in San Juan. And I remember, you know, coming in the same bar where I had met him. And as I come in the door, he stands up towards me, hugs me, and all my grudges were gone. You know, it was like, good, he's back, you know. Good, you're back. Yeah, sure, good, you're back too. So, so we, like, nothing ever happened. There was nothing that needed to be talked about. Uh, you know, it was, uh, we had very powerful, I mean, you know, besides being two ego manifestors, we had the 14-2 electromagnetic. I had the channel of struggle to his integration. He loved strugglers. He really did. And the 2644 electromagnetic, being two defined egos, yeah, it was, it was a nice part of it. So there was a lot of just frequency, you know, and like I said, yeah, I had been in Pune. I, I am sensitive. So, you know, um, I can take it now to the very beginning of my answer. He was Mr. Frequency. So he was not just my friend. He was my first nine-centered friend. And he was the cleanest emotional mirror I could ever find. You know, because he was, uh, he was not holding back his, his love and his grace with me when that is what was, he was receiving from me when he was receiving something else, you know, the fact that I was unaware of what it means to come with that stuff to someone else. And uh, he was very cool. You know, he would not take it, but he would not 
reject me or punish me or he was very graceful. Mm -hmm. You know, he did not need to say I was sensitive too. So it was very funny because being both very male guys, we were very feminine with each other. You know, we were not, our relationship was not mentally driven, even though we were both passionate by something that was deeply mental, you understand? I was just lucky. I mean, you know, he, he worked on me. He worked with me. You know, he, he, I only had one reading in my life. That was the first reading I, I shared with you before. But then, you know, every time we met, he would give me something. He would tell me something. And then, you know, when he introduced things, I was intelligent enough to understand what that meant, considering I had the desire that I have. And if I had any question, then I, would, I, I could come and ask him, uh, listen, I heard you say this. I'm jumping on this conclusion. How far away am I from? And he would just say, you're right, or no, that's not like this, or add this to that, or whatever, you know, depending on. So I was very fortunate in Maybe I also was one of his first guinea pigs, you know. I actually think, like he said once in the lecture, you know, if human design can wake up a lock, it can wake up anyone. Mm -hmm. Which is also like saying, if a lock understands it and has no doubts, to, no questions to ask, anyone should be able to understand it. You know, I had not been to university. and You know, it was like, I'm the average. I ask you the questions that the average human B would ask you at some point if they have a little bit of intelligence and they really care to know for themselves. Well, this is the human design system and this is what I loved about him. I'll give you an example. I translated this black book and you know human design is a new language. So when you look dictionaries, you don't find the word that can satisfy you. So, uh, you know, I had to make up my own. And of course, I did a few mistakes, bad mistakes. Anyway, before bringing this to the printer, I thought I better filter this through a professional translator. So I engaged the guy and I told him, you know, can you look at this? I pay you and uh, give me some feedback. And the guy told me it's a throwaway. It's a throwaway. I was devastated. I mean, you know, my money had gone in there. Like, So I went to Ra, and I told, the, I told him the truth. He told me it's a throwaway. But then, you know, I knew that professional translators, they hated when non-professional translators translate something, you know. <laughs> so he was not going to give me a nice feedback. And I remember Ra looking at me, and he asked me, is it good enough for you? I said, Yes. And it's good enough for me. It goes to the print. And it went to the print. You know, I guess he knew that uh, normal standards were anyway not applicable, you know, to whatever him and I were trying to do. So, oh, see, this is how I learned. Do you understand? I mean, normally someone would not do that. But he did. And I laugh because I still have boxes of the book, which got printed, you know, now it's not even on sale anymore. You know, I got boxes here. <laughs> that wasn't the point, you know, the point was to start the experiment and he was already seven years in it when I met him. And he was very honest, you know, he was the first student of human design. He was the first one testing, you know, the logic and the potential truth of what he had been given. You know, because that he is a crazy man. I think he knew that before him and meeting the world. <laughs> I think everybody who knew him before that knew how crazy he could be. But that he could be the man he became after that experience. I think no one expected that. I don't think even he expected that. Like I didn't expect to be the man I am today. I didn't expect to feel so comfortable in life despite the turmoil of the current times. So maybe we can ask about that since, since you mentioned it. You've been doing this program called The Program Is Not Your Life. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and, and what you're seeing through that? 
especially in the current time? Human design is deeply mystical. But it is mystical in the way in which, in which I am mystical. Because I did not know this, I didn't consider myself to be mystical at all. The mystical for me was, you quote, more imagination. Because like I said, you know, the, the point was, can you pay your bills at the end of the month? How mystical is that? I mean, I had no time for pondering the mystical, you know what I mean? So I was not into that. I wasn't looking for a guru when I met Osho. Really, I wasn't. I was not spiritually inclined. I did not know objectively much about me other than what I heard people say about me. So I didn't think myself as mystical at all. When I met him in design, you know, there were moments where Ra would speak about the program or about everything, the not self, where I could not avoid feeling that. How can you be so sure? How can you be so sure? How can you be so sure? Why is there not an exception to this? Not that I could think of one, but maybe we don't know. Maybe there's something we, you know, you, do you know? Do you know everything? You, you understand? It was, I mean, the normal questions anyone that is asks that is not used to operate on absolutes. And if I had anything, any relationship with absolutes was one of mistrust. So, and because I was coming from astrology to human design and the way transits are used in astrology, I told you I was more oriented towards the body and not the concepts. In human design, to look at somebody through their design made their design deeply tangible to me because like... I saw Ra seeing me from the inside. I could have such an insight into the nature of the others, seeing them through their design, both their openness and their definition, that it changed the quality of my communication with everybody immediately. Immediately, as a manifestor, it's the first thing I noticed. You know, my communication with the world was a lot better. And people were a lot more interested in what I had to say. That, for one, was very, very clear. So there was this, there were composites, there was the mechanics of sexuality. There is a, so deeply tangible to think about the transits. I would listen to his daily view, you know, today's first line day and a second line day. You know, these are nuances in the frequency. And at that time, I wasn't yet tuned into frequency. You understand? I needed something much more solid. So I was following and paying attention and listening to some of his comments, seeing the logic behind them. I actually translated many of his Brave New Year talks to Spanish many, many times. So when he died, Spanish people were not going to have their Brave New Year anymore. Okay. So I thought, hey, you know how to do this. You saw how, how he did it. You know what he used. You know the tools. So just go there, do it. So I started doing it like, okay, like what I do when, I, when I'm going to read someone's design. I don't know the person, so what do I do? I tell them what, the, what the, the design says. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what the design says. You know, and I tell them the good and the bad of this, and I tell them the not self-management that they know and have been doing, and I tell them the alternative that they have strategy and authority. And that's it. So I thought, you do the same. And that's what I do. And then I start getting this feedback. Not only getting this feedback, you know, once you give attention to things and you know how to look at things, you start seeing things. So this is what happened. I started doing it and I started seeing, hey, this is not difficult. It's logical. You know, so I did not focus on, no, just the obvious. And with just the obvious, you can point at very specific themes that are there. And then I would watch what follows and what happens. And I would like, wow. So I got this idea of doing this program is not your life as a yearly program. So that instead of looking at the program once a year, right new year, I get a chance to do it once a month. You understand? It was basically a way to engage myself. So I developed the discipline to use my analytical skills for a purpose that I had never dedicated much attention to because Ra was doing it and 
I didn't really, you know, it was like in the field where it could get too confused with astrology that it was for me, okay, just stay away from it. And when I did this first time, the program is not your life, I focused on the solar program first, you know, the godheads, and it's very solid. It's very near the surface because it's just there. It's like commenting on the nuances of spring, summer, autumn, you know, the natural life cycle. And a little bit of the outer planets because they stay for very long in the same gate. So, you know, I would focus my attention on those things. Slowly I started, you know, I started developing a certain level of skill. I started developing a certain depth also in my connection to each singular planet. And so each version that I do, I introduce like new elements to make it more tangible. This year, for instance, I'm working with the, with the chart of participants, but on a, on a weekly basis. So I, I show four charts, one, one per week, and then the composite with one particular participant so that people, participants get a much more concrete idea and sense of how the program impacts on, on us when we are operating as not self. You know, I started to see the program as something more substantial, you know, not as intangible as, as I used to. But what happened in the last two months keeps me in awe. I cannot believe it that I would ever get such, a, such an obvious definition of what the global circumstance is because of the program is pointing at it uh, on, on a nano, na nanometer scale. You know, the position of the gates of the nodes of the moon, the lines, the very specific lines and the timeline of the breakout of this COVID crisis, the movement, the presence now of Neptune in gate 22, the channel of social openness, and the planet of misinformation, in the sense that we don't really you know, we're keeping social distances, but we don't really know if we should, you know, or if we should not, or if we should, how, or, you know, it's like, are we really, is this enough? Or, you know, maybe I should do more. Than... And the presence of Pluto in the 61.5, everybody looking for the one person that can unify criteria and tell us, hey, guys, this way. This is the new way. And Uranus in the 27, pointing at our immune system. The south node in the 58, which is a gate of fear because it belongs to the quarter of mutation. It represents the dogmas of science. And it points at the spleen, at the gate of the fear of the authorities not knowing what to do when there is a problem. The collective fear. <laughs> and it's in the third line. Electricity. And there's these theories right now going around that how much this today has to do with the beginning of electricity, which actually got me buying some books to investigate. How did that happen? Because it's interesting. The mutation bit from 7 to 9 centered Humanity cannot be explained without electricity. Funny thing is the North Node in the gate of inaction. See, when you read the subtitle of this gate, it says self-imposed inaction for the benefit of assessment. Self-imposed. But the third line very specifically speaks about inaction that is imposed by outside forces. Wow. Wow. And you know what the 52 is? This is the gate of Parvati. And it's one thing to have a Parvati mother, which can be, you know, damaging. But to have a Parvati institutions? How about that? when state wants to be more responsible for your health than you can be. 
Now, this is what's being discussed now, the North Node. How is Mama's state going to make sure we don't die and we still believe to be eternal? You see, it used to be easy to sell the same regurgitated shit to public opinion. But it's, it's no longer possible. Now, this does not mean there's no fear. Because the whole thing that's going on now, this is what I see in the program, this fear reaction. I don't care if there is a virus or no, there's always virus. But the fear, the fear, that's what's different, not the virus. Viruses have always been there. But the fear reaction, just because we could all die. Now, people don't react like this because you could all die. They react because they could die. We're selfish creatures, come on. Politicians hierarchically just take advantage of this because this is how we operate in groups. It's, you know, it's always the groups. Politics is for the groups, it's not for the individuals. You know, the group of people that think this, the groups of people that think that, you know, statistics. and There's no truth in any of that. What I noticed also, what kept me coming back, was seeing that since the last couple of years, the South Node is in mutation. So it's about dogmas and it's moving backwards. So all the dogmas of humankind are going to be reviewed before 2027. Now, oh, isn't that amazing? And Pluto is there. So I got really interested in, okay, I want to follow this. And it is an interest that has increased itself this year, 2020, because I realized this is seven years. So I figured if I don't die, I'm going to do this program uninterruptedly, at least until then. Because I was not someone who thought, yeah, when 2027 comes, we're going to see something that, now, I really kept my expectations very low that in 2028, probably I would see nothing that would make me feel like, oh, there is the rape there, or the system is collapsing. If you told me that what we are witnessing today would happen in 2027, I would fall on my knees and pray to Raul Hu. Now, we're seeing this in 2020. Seven years before this. So I'm, a, I'm afraid of what I may still get to see before 2027. Because the next gate that Neptune is going to go into after 22, and social distances, distancing, it's the 36. Now, the 36, you know, is about spreading deceit. That's what it is, really. So it can spread anything. It can spread anger. It can spread desire. It can spread nationalist feelings. And guess what? The North Node after Lakshmi gates are going to go into, after Parvati gates are going to go into Lakshmi gates, of which the 35 is one. So the 36, 35, the crisis, you know. I'm like, if in the 12, in the 22, this is what it does. What will it do when it goes to the 36? Well, I'm not going to hold my breath until then, but uh, it got me curious in the sense that the movie is undoubtedly interesting. And it's getting interesting at a level where I at least seem to be able to see behind the veils of what's being discussed in the media, you know, and the different... It's clear to me that no one knows. Life is a mystery. You know, it's just, we no longer can keep the appearances that someone knows for everyone because no one, not everybody will allow. You know, there's this, we move beyond a place where old fashioned seven centered control mechanisms are no longer efficient. So we have the disadvantage of, the advantage and the disadvantage of certain truths having become evident. In the sense, 
some can be inspired by some, you know, they can suddenly fall into deep uncertainty because whatever they thought was real suddenly isn't. It is, it is allowing me to gain deeper insight into the nature of being human existentially, but also into, you know, our species and the role of our species in evolution after all. It seems that a lot of things were going on before we came into stage. So if we weren't the first ones to come, well, why should we be last? The other thing it makes me wonder, given given what we're seeing globally and, and everything that you're talking about uh, and thinking uh -huh. about the body graph and the, the recent course we've done with you, I'm curious about how you might talk about the relationship between science and truth. It's a polarity. It's the 61 and the 62. And in the right angle, they're both gates of Maya. So truth and science is an illusion. It's a made-up order. It's how we learn to redefine human. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human in the world of today? Now, which world of today? Africa or United States or China? or You know what I mean? In other words, it's, it's a mechanism. You can't separate science from truth. But you see, the thing in this polarity is we have one pole, it's truth and it's individual. We have the other pole, it's science and it's collective. In other words, if other people agree on what you claim to be true, then maybe, maybe it is. Because, you know, what if one does not agree? Is it true if one of us does not agree? Is it absolutely true if one of us does not agree? So how much do we need? 51%? 50, you understand? I mean, we know we are not hip hip hypocritical enough to mix that up with politics. We know what politicians, they don't represent truth, they represent power. So they can impose certain facts. You have to distinguish the public concept, idea, truth. The truth is what science discusses. Whether you call that philosophy or you call that psychology, it's always about discussing the truth, discussable truths. But see, this is collective. It looks for the strategic use of truth. We want, you know, and human truth is we are here to take advantage of the environment. We are here to survive, you know, be the last man standing in evolution. Even if we have to kill everything around us to be able to do that. That's us, you know, real predators. So this is how Homo sapiens came about. This is how we managed to go to the moon. We call it science. And of course, there's no illusion there. There's no relativity there because the formulas have to be, you understand? This is how we have been raised. Eddie, it's how the world works. Now, human design came up in a time where, you know, the fundamental myths of humanity were already falling. You know, it wasn't human design that killed God. It was Nietzsche and many of his contemporaries because the contradictions between certain dogmas and human experience were too obvious that some voices would not raise against the actual meaning of human. We need to redefine human because, you know, what I'm feeling doesn't match it, you know, and I... I can't change, you know, this kind of stuff. You know, it's just updating what is adequate, what is inadequate. Perfecting our idea of human. Perfecting our own imaginary order. That we are here to do God's work. Excuse me? Whose work? Who's God? You know? That we are here for a purpose. There has to be a purpose. That if there is no purpose, you know, you, you kill yourself. Well, why? You're going to die anyway. If you want to die, don't look after yourself. Eventually you'll die, but why do it violently? It was clear. Science could never explain my wound in my open sacrum. 
Science and psychology could never explain the craziness I could watch inside myself. You know, I'm an emotional person. If you cannot explain certain things to me about my life, I don't care what you believe in. Time's too short and I'm, you know, to want to know everything. And No, I had my own questions to ask. And science just wasn't good enough at explaining them. You know, I, I looked, I looked in the libraries, I looked in the... Yes, in Osho I found that there is life beyond reason, which was the beginning of the healing as an emotional being. You know, and I had deep experience. Human design was the explanation. And yes, of course, with the explanation, the tools to be able to refine what I had experienced in Pune at a very gross energy level, you know, to now be able to, you know, when I was in Pune listening to Osho speak about the witness, I thought, well, what the hell, the witness, you know, where's the witness in me, you know, do I know the witness? Or awakening, what is this awakening? You know? Now with human design, I feel like a scientist of awakening. Do you know what I mean? It is not a concept. It is not, it is a mechanic. It is, uh, it's something that's organic, yeah, and I can humor about it. It's what human design gives you. See, human design has four types. Each type has a strategy and a mental dilemma. In other words, a way to re-educate your thinking. Because that's what those mental dilemmas are. You know, it's, a, it's an open door to not use your mind through the habits. Not use your mind in automatic pilot. You know, bring your mind to the zero point of what's there in front of you. What does it have to do with who you think you are? You understand? And that's what they are. They're, I, I sometimes call them shamanic pills. Because they are. If you use that strategy and that mental dilemma and you take it to the edge, you're going to meet each and every layer of mental fear that you ever have accumulated. You know, this is what deconditioning is because it's an inner work that no one can do for you. Now, not everybody's ready for that. Nobody, not everybody thirsts for that kind of liberation. You know, some people are comfortable in their comfort zone. I was not. You know, the comfort zone is deeply connected to the penta. So people who have penta definition, they can install themselves for some time in this comfort zone and let life just, you know, I couldn't. I mean, I had my share of fun, hey. It was not like I was, I had vocation for fun. But I had deep discomfort, half half. You know, the up was great, the down was horrible. I did not know how to handle the down of anything. The down of being me. I couldn't tell how much of it was me and how much of it was someone else, someone's fault. So um, it's deeply magical, you know, and at the same time, I mean, it's deeply magical, the transformation in the perception of who I am for myself. But what made this possible was a logic that is not, you know, not just sophisticated and beautiful, but it has a structure. And wherever I have looked at humans, through that structure, it has been so much easier to accept what is. And wherever I can make difference, to know how, to know what to say and to whom to say it and to... And now, you know, I don't, know, I don't care about the truths we discuss. I appreciate that people make comments when I post something on Facebook. But you see, I discuss things with myself before I put them out. And once I'm done with that discussion, I don't care what anybody says. 
And if you come and tell me there is something wrong in it, and you are right, and I can see it, I thank you. I thank you because I'm always happy to learn something. You understand? This is like, I, I'm not selling my dogma. I'm just using logic. And that's an incredible thing. That's an incredible. I mean, if you are someone that works for the transformation of the awareness of self, this is a tool, you know, uh, an incredible tool, clean. You don't tell people what to do. You, you, don't, you know, you empower them. You know, it's not therapy, but it's deeply therapeutical. And all you need to do is be yourself and share the knowledge that you have gracefully with the person that's there on your fractal. Tops. If I had the freedom to imagine something that would then become true, I do not think I could have imagined something that fits so perfectly. And it's not because it was all ideal after I met human design. Oh no, life is not ideal. I still had a lot of darkness to integrate. But hey, I needed no therapy, no good. You understand? I was, yes, Rob was there. I could ask. Then again, like I said, he would sometimes not answer. Do you know what I mean? So it would depend. So I learned eventually to not ask and keep the questions inside until I had my own answer. And then check if my answer was correct or not. Rather than have him think for me and explain it to me again, you know? No. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Let me, let me see. Yeah. It's like one of our ABC sessions. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was fun. And, you know, considering how close I have been to Ra, if you look around, you would not find a lot of me talking about him. Okay. Or about my personal relationship with him. I like the way he came out. It's good it's somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very moving to me. It's nice to share it with you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you for listening to the Human Design Collective Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please review us and share. For more information about us and to connect with others on this experimental journey, please visit us at humandesigncollective.com. You can also learn more by exploring our course and workshop offerings at courses.humandesigncollective.com. Music for the Human Design Collective podcast, courtesy of Role Model. For more information, see the show notes. And please stay tuned for more upcoming episodes on the same channel. 